All right, we have our one last speaker. Uh, we're going to have a slightly different uh, approach at the moment. We're going to jump ahead a little bit in history. So we have Isabel Acosta, who is Assistant Professor of Classics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She works primarily on Roman religion, and she's going to be talking to us about reading nymphs and Roman soldiers, sounds lascivious, with and without Fraser. So Isabel, please take it away. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for what's been a very interesting conference so far. I feel bad about taking us away from the Minoans, and in fact, moving us forward quite a few years. Um, but I think we will see many of the themes that have come up in this panel so far um, also reflected at least a little bit in what I'm going to do here. So. What I want to do today is explore the usefulness and pitfalls of using Fraser's theories to interpret a set of dedications made by soldiers in Roman Britain to nymphs. Nymphs are minor deities who are associated with water. They are often strongly localized, that is, we can imagine them as spirits of place. The best known sources on them, ancient Greek mythological tales, often cast them as rather dangerous. As in this famous depiction of the tale of Hylas, they are fond of abducting beautiful young men. By the same token, gods and mortals too can abduct nymphs. Hence, nymphs have extensive and often coercive relations with other beings. In addition to mythological tales, ample physical remains attest to the worship of nymphs in both the Greek and the Roman world. As already recognized by Fraser, Nymphs are ideal for thinking through interactions between mortals and the divine. So I'm going to start with a brief outline of Nymphs in the Golden Bough and more recent work on Greek and Roman religion. Then I'm going to introduce four dedications that I intend to use as case studies. And finally, I'm going to attempt a Fraserian and non-Fraserian reading of these objects to explore the usefulness and limitations of these approaches. Nymphs are quite prominent in the Golden Bough. The work famously opens um, with, the, with an idyllic description of Diana's sanctuary at Nemi based on Turner's painting. Fraser describes the various votive offerings at the site and also mentions that Diana is not the only one worshiped here. Nymphs too have their place at Nemi. The worship of nature deities, including nymphs, is therefore a programmatic concern in the text. For Fraser, nymphs are connected with water and woods. He does not bother to distinguish between them and dryads, woodland spirits. Elsewhere in the text, nymph through, nymphs through their connection with water are associated with fertility. Unlike a deity like Diana, they cannot leave the grove or spring with which they are associated. But when they are there, they can be dangerous. So abduction by nymphs, which I've already mentioned as a theme, is discussed at quite some length. All in all, these watery, shadowy female figures appear as a potentially dangerous force and an opposite to kings who are associated with fire. But at the same time, nymphs are necessary for cycles of fertility. The worship of these nymphal beings is most attractive to women, especially at transitional moments in their lives. There is one notable exception to this pattern, Egeria. According to Roman legend, the nymph Egeria has a sexual relationship with Rome's second king. Numa, she might, might have even, with Rome's second king, Numa, she might have even been his wife. She inspires the king's various legal and religious innovations and is therefore a founding figure in Roman culture. In his discussion of Egeria, Fraser departs quite notably from his ancient sources. In the Golden Bough, she is not cast as a minor water spirit, but as a manifestation of the goddess Diana. Nymph, Numa hence has a direct connection with an important deity, something that is quite central to Fraser's theories about early kingships because he essentially becomes a, a temporary di divine consort. In any case, his discussion of Egeria, though extensive, has no direct relevance to our understanding of nymphs in the work because Egeria is um, explicitly not cast as a nymph. So to return to watery and potential female deities, 
Fraser's theories are not too far off from at least some modern discussions of nymphs. Studies of nymphs in the ancient Greek world predominate the scholarly landscape. Here, considerable emphasis has been placed on the deities and coercion, both nymphs as abductors and abductees. In effect, nymphs represent pure, untouched nature, and meeting them always has a two-way potential for confrontation and violence. Studies of actual dedications have been particularly interested in female worshippers. And while they do not identify the worship of nymphs as a primarily female cult, a casual reader of these analyses might reach that conclusion. In the study of Roman religion, by contrast, nymphs primarily appear as spirits of place, especially of springs, and are worshipped by both men and women. In fact, male worshippers dominate in the record. We have a significant number of inscriptions that identify dedications to the goddesses or signal that a certain territory is under their protection. These finds have been treated as evidence of Roman popular religion. They demonstrate personal worship practices away from the concerns of the state cult. Some scholars even go as far as calling these rites and rituals transgressive, but we need not go that far. With all this in mind, I want to turn to some Roman material and look at examples of the worship of nymphs by ordinary Romans from Roman Britain. 13 inscribed stone objects, altars, and dedicatory slabs attesting to the worship of nymphs have been found across England and southern Scotland. Those that can be dated fall between the second and early third centuries CE, the height of Roman activity in the province of Britannia. For most objects, the original find context is unfortunately lost since they were removed in the late, 19th, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to become part of collections. Of the 13 artifacts that have survived, five are connected to the army, two concern the imperial administration, and the rest can be tied to the civilian population, including three dedications by women. I'm going to concentrate on dedications by soldiers because they constitute a significant part of the corpus and because they pose the biggest challenges to models of what nymphs are and who worships them and why. They are dedications by men to minor female deities. Many of them are group rather than individual offerings and hence obscure the boundaries between personal and official cult. And they mostly cast nymphs as generic protectors rather than as potentially dangerous spirits. So let me introduce four representative examples. To start with, we have an altar dedicated by an officer at ancient Brocolitia near Hadrian's Wall. The altar made of buff sandstone is about a meter in height, quite normal for such a dedicatory object. It was found near a Roman fort adjacent to a well and quite strangely a Mithraeum. Nymphs and Mithras are generally not associated with each other. In fact, one could cast them as polar opposites. Mithra's cult is for men only, and its rites take place in caves hidden from view. The nymphs, by contrast, are, have worshippers of both sexes and are goddesses of the outside. But to return to our altar, the lettering of the inscription and the fine context dated to the first third of the third century CE. The inscription reads, for the nymphs and the genius of the place, Marcus Hispanius Modesti Modestinus, Prefect of the first cohort of the Batavians, on behalf of himself and his family, willingly and deservedly set this up. Our prefect is not otherwise attested, but his name suggests Spanish origins. Our next altar comes from Chester. It has roughly the same dimensions as the previous object, but is made from red sandstone. Its original context cannot be reconstructed and a reasonably precise dating is also impossible. It is a group dedication with an inscription that reads, to the nymphs and fountains, the 20th legion Valeria Victrix set this up. Here is another altar from near Hadrian's wall. It breaks the standard dedicatory format that we have seen in the previous two inscriptions. It is the smallest and most decorated of the lot, but not by much. It's about 70 centimeters in height. The fine context is a bit unclear, but it seems to come from a Roman fort. Like the first altar, it is made out of buff sandstone. The inscription reads, Forewarned by a dream, the soldier bade her, who is married to Fabius, 
to set up this altar to the nymphs who are to be worshipped. Finally, a fragment of an altar. It is not the product of the Roman military, but of the imperial administration. It was found somewhere near Hadrian's Wall in 1609 and is recorded in various drawings like the one you have on screen here, but is now lost. No dimensions have been transmitted, but it can be dated quite precisely on the basis of the text to 211 to 217 CE. The inscription reads, this offering to the goddess nymph Brigantia, which he had bowed for the welfare and safety of our Lord, the invincible emperor, Marcus Aurelius Severus, Antonius Pius, Felix Augustus, and of his whole divine house, Marcus Cacaeus Negrinus, procurator of our emperor, and most devoted to his divinity and majesty, gladly, willingly, and deservedly fulfilled. Brigantia is a Celtic goddess. This text is unique in calling her a nymph. So now that we've met these dedications, what are we to make of all of this? If we read these texts with Fraser, the dream inscription is undoubtedly the most exciting. The text is enigmatic. A soldier whose name may or may not be Fabius is advised in a dream to tell an unnamed woman to set up an altar for the nymphs. While it is not unusual to have dedications inspired by a dream, the person who receives the dream and the dedicator are usually one and the same. It is also very unusual for dedicators not to be explicit about their name. After all, the offering is a manifestation of their piety and deserves public recognition. Finally, the inscription is hexametric. It is my only metrical inscription, a meter that is associated among other things with prophecy. Fraser's theories might offer an explanation for many of these puzzling features. The nymphs are a threatening presence who force humans to do things. People do not want to identify themselves by name because they do not want to draw further attention from the divine beings. The strong association of nymphs with women might explain why the woman steps in to dedicate the altar. Somebody reading with Fraser in mind might find the, the dedication by the procurator to be the oddest. It casts the nymphs as the deities of health and protectors of kings a direct contradiction of their role as outlined in the Golden Bow. That said, one could perhaps try a Nigeria-style argument here. The dedication is not to a generic nymph, but to one specific nymph. Moreover, as I already mentioned, this is the only evidence that we have for Brigantia being identified as a nymph. Maybe here too, we have a goddess looking out for kings, at least temporarily, and our dedicator has just made a taxonomic mistake. Little can probably be said about the other two inscriptions, though one could perhaps argue that soldiers faced with a constant threat of life might want to stay on the good side of liminal and threatening water deities. When read against more recent approaches to ancient personal religious practices, Marcus's dedication to the health of the emperor also emerges as a particularly puzzling example. It connects the worship of the nymphs with the imperial cult and concerns for the emperor's welfare preoccupations that we normally credit to state religion. The text therefore collapses concern, the concerns of public and private religious practices in perhaps uncomfortable ways, especially if we go for a transgressive reading of personal practices. Similar issues are at work when it comes to the much shorter group dedication by the 20th Legion. Nymphs are assumed to be personal deities. So Mosestinus' dedication is much more typical. And a dedication by an entire legion does not seem to be the pat it does not seem to fit the pattern. Even in this brief discussion, it should be clear that the two analytical modes, a Fraserian reading and a personal popular religion reading, highlight different features of these inscriptions as odd and interesting. Although many of his theories have been superseded, Fraser's analytical approaches are not far off from nymphs as we come across them in classical mythology. Where his models run into trouble is with actual dedicatory material, but there too, work on personal religion encounters its challenges. Ideas about who nymphs are and why they are worshiped and by whom are too diverse to be explained through any one framework. So to sum up, even just looking at four inscriptions demonstrates the diversity of ways in which the inhabitants of Roman Britain worship the nymphs. 
In fact, it is difficult to use this body of evidence to support the idea that there is a fixed cult of the nymphs with stable characteristics recognized by all. The nymphs appear as spirits of place, prophetic figures, and guardians of the health of emperors. They receive dedications from groups and individuals, men and women, locals, and those born far away. When we study these objects against the background of the Golden Bough, we get an explanation for some of these peculiarities, but not for others. The dedications are above all a warning against universalizing explanations and approaches in the historical study of popular religions. Thank you very much.